much. My name's Emma. I've probably seen quite a few of you around the track as we've met with different wildlife concerns or you may have heard on the phone um, when you've had a chat to say, I found a certain animal, what do I do? So today's seminars really come out of all of those questions that I hear along the tracks, all those Facebook posts that we see up on all of the community websites when people have found an animal or there's an animal that is probably not doing what people expect it to do or they just wanna know a little bit more. So we have titled this presentation, Helping You Help Them because we really want to empower you to find a solution to whichever problem that may be, but also know where to look to for help. So as Jen mentioned, I do run a shelter. I run the Bungalow Creek Wildlife Shelter and have been doing so for about well, 15 years, I think we're up to. Um, the shelter is completely run by volunteers. We don't receive any government funding to do what we do. And on a good year, it costs about $30,000 to rehabilitate and release wildlife back to their natural state. And on a bad year, it can be up to 70,000. So there's a lot of personal funds that go into this. Um, why do I do it? Why do I spend so much money on it? Because I love it. Um, it's really important to me that our wildlife remain wild. It's really important to me that we don't continue to see the death and destruction that many of you would have had your eyes open to with bushfires. Um, the bushfires were a horrific event, potentially a billion animals lost. Um, animal populations survive with diversity, just like you and I, our genetic makeup isn't the same, and that's how animal populations survive too. So catastrophic events such as bushfires can make a really large student now population and also lessen the resilience of these populations in the future. The shelter itself, we tend to focus on some of the harder cases. Um, we are known throughout Victoria to be able to look after many of the eastern grey joeys that have significant trauma. So the fractures, the um, fence hanging injuries, which are basically degloving of a whole foot usually. Um, and many of these cases require a lot more focused energy, a lot more medical treatment. We have a lot of amazing vets that work with us on the property um, and thankfully we've got some medical training as well. We also network with um, licensed shelters throughout Victoria and it's a really amazing group of people, exceptionally passionate and really happy to share their knowledge and obviously we educate as well, which is why I'm here today. So before we kind of go into what to do if you find something, it's really important to know what everything is. I cannot tell you the amount of times that I've had someone come to me going, I found a baby possum, it's only a week old, and I'm staring at a probably a nine month old ringtail who really does not want me anywhere near it and is going to be out in the wild. Hopefully you can see my mouse and we'll really quickly go through this because I believe you're gonna have access to this slide pack later anyhow. Um, on the really left-hand side, cupped in my hand are two baby ringtail possums. So these guys are probably maybe a month old thereabouts. And if I remember correctly, their mum was killed by a cat. As a wildlife shelter and a wildlife carer, we get a lot of pressure from just the general public that we need to be able to save everything. Unfortunately, our marsupials are so well structured that quite often when we get youngsters, the size of these two little ring towers, we aren't set up to be able to raise these animals. They live in their mum's pouch. It's like a humidity crib 24 seven and we just can't replicate that environment. Um, in saying that when they're bigger, then amazing. We've got a red hot go at raising these guys free to release. So really young ringtail joeys here and this is what we really want them to grow into that picture underneath it. Next to those guys is we've got the baby brush tails. I cannot tell you how many times I get told I've got a baby rat um, and it's actually a baby possum. They are amazing creatures. They have adapted so well to suburbia, probably a little bit too well for a few of you. Um, but in terms of their nature, they're exceptionally brave, bold, and they will give anything a red hot go. We've got our little sugar gliders in the middle. Um, you've probably heard them and may not have ever seen them. We get a lot of sugar gliders that come in through barbed wire, um, fence entanglement, um, it really, does a lot of damage to their potassium, which is that membrane in the middle that basically makes them fly through the air, and a lot of cat attacks because they're small and they're quite often out when cats are out too. 
um, we do get a lot of those guys in. Next to those guys are the wombat. So the wombat next to the 50 cent piece is probably only a few weeks old. I was brought her and told to raise her and I really had to be quite honest and say there's just no chance. Not even the best care in the world will be able to raise something that small. Um, it would require drip feeding probably every five or so minutes, massive environmental control, and even then it still relies so heavily on its mother's milk to get all those um, immunity properties that she is giving it. Further down, we've got little Fergie um, in the pouch. She is a size that is well and truly able to be raised by experienced shelters. And then obviously we've got Marnie down the bottom who is getting ready to be soft released. Right next to that picture of little Fergie are a picture of a few little bunnies. They aren't wombats. I think every shelter could tell you that we get calls all the time. We found a baby wombat, it's all by itself. It shouldn't be by itself. And you go send us a photo and sure enough, it's a baby bunny. As a wildlife shelter um, registered with the department, we're actually not allowed to take an invasive species. Um, there are many other rescue groups. There's a few um, rabbit rescue groups that I'm sure could help, but um, as registered wildlife shelters and carers, we're actually not allowed to look after anything that's non-native. Finally, at the end, we've got our kangaroos. I'm not gonna lie, they probably are one of my um, favorite and might be a little bit biased about these creatures. They are probably the, one, the ones that have the most toughest gig in Australia with how much perceived competition there is and how our governments are really quite happy to flag the slaughtering industry that basically pays their wages. With the roos, we obviously, they're probably the ones that we hear the most about, um, purely because they're the biggest. They're often the hardest to, for a um, member of public like you to do anything with if they come into strife. This is certainly not all the marsupials in the world. There are so many others, but these are probably the ones that we see the most of. The first few slides are really just going through these different species and there will be other species. Google will be your friend if you find something. Flick it on one of the chats, someone will be able to tell you what it is, but hopefully this gives you a bit of an idea about what they look like as an adult. Not, it's not necessarily what they look like as a youngster. We also get a lot of questions about rats. We do have native rats in Australia. We've got several different species. We've got the water rat, the bush rat, and we've also got a marsupial, uh, a carnivorous marsupial, which looks quite similar to a rat, which is actually an antiphinus. So these guys are all native and they do an amazing um, job at controlling some of our insect populations. Some of our antiphinus will actually eat small rodents like our mice, our introduced mice and rats. A lot of insect control, everything in between. So probably one of the most common things that pops up on Facebook is, I've got a rat, what is it? Um, really can be very difficult to tell the difference between a bush rat, which is our native rat, and an introduced rat species, which is often the one that's found in your chook shed. As you can see from the photos, we've got on the left-hand side, a invasive black rat, and on the right-hand side, we've got our native bush rats. There's not a huge amount of difference when you look at the below photo and the introduced rat. And unfortunately, that's just the way it rolls. There are some identifying features between the two. Our native bush rat often has a shorter, thinner tail. The introduced rat often will have a longer tail. So realistically, if you rat that you're seeing has a really long tail that kind of could go up and over its head and around its body slightly, then chances are you've got a black rat. Differences in faces, um, your bush rat has quite a concave, so rounded face, whereas your black rat's got a more pointed face and they've got big ears. But really, let's be frank with you, unless you've got both standing next to each other, it can be really hard. And quite often the easiest way to get an answer is to flick it onto one of those pages. There's a couple of naturalist pages on there as well that could give some really good ideas. When we are looking at rats and looking at rodent control, a lot of people will put their hands on to the um, pesticide use. So those little rat pellets that people spread in their roofs or spread in their gardens. We pop, 
control of invasive species is really important, but we also have to look at the secondary consequences. So most of those poisons that are out there to control rats will not only control rats, but it will also then kill off our native um, birds of prey, but then feed on those dead rats. So really, really important to look at what rodent, rodents decide you're using to see whether it has a secondary life. We will get a lot of barn owls, um, not so many tawnies because they're more your know, insect feeders, but those smaller birds of prey who really do rely on the rodent population. And Mika wasn't the invasive black rat, but they would be looking at our smaller marsupials like your antichinus and potentially your bush rats as their main feed. They are turning to the black rats and mice because there's so many around. Um, so really just be mindful that you, if you are trying to reduce your population of introduced rats and mice, that you really look at what you're using to do that, because I would really hope that you are not intentionally wanting to then kill our amazing nocturnal birds of prey. So enough about the rats. We also have a few other mammals that are around. Um, again, I'm going to be pretty biased and say grey-headed flying foxes are probably one of my favourite animals to raise. Their intelligence is like no other. They are exceptionally closely related to our primate species. And whilst I understand that many people are a little bit marginalized and a little bit scared of them, and I would never be um, advocating for you as a general member of public to go and handle these animals because they do have really sharp teeth. Um, they are so, so important to our old growth forests. They are the ones that spread the pollination, they spread the seeds. They are the ones that are responsible for keeping all those beautiful gum trees alive that our koalas and every other native species relies on so heavily. And realistically, I would really hope that that is one of the reasons that you have chosen to live up in the Yarra Ranges because we have such beautiful bush life. The grey head of flying foxes don't cope very well in those heat events. Um, I do hear on and on, but we've always had heat wire our animals suffering. They shouldn't be suffering, just leave them to it. It's not so much the heat crisis that gets them, it's the fact that we have also destroyed and changed and modified their habitat so much that their old refuges that generations before them used to use have now gone. They don't have anywhere to shelter in a beautiful hollow in a gum tree anymore. We've taken them all down. So these guys and particularly our possum species in heat just don't do well. Fruit netting, and I will come to that a bit later, is also a massive problem for the grey-headed flying foxes, um, as well as many other species, especially bird species. Um, I understand having fruit trees myself that people don't necessarily want to be leaving them uncovered for the lorikeets and every other naughty bird species who decides to take a bite out of here, bite out of there and then throw them on the ground before they're ready. But look at from a different point of view. Whoever originally made your house, originally made your paddock, would probably have taken away a lot of native vegetation that these animals would have used to feed off. So whilst, you know, I do like to have my own apples too, Think about sharing them. You can get some really nice little mesh sleeves from Bunnings or you can make it up, make them up yourself and just slip them over a few branches and, you know, maybe try and share some of the fruits of your labour with our native wildlife because they do struggle. The little micro bats, I saw a post only a couple of days ago on, fight, on Facebook saying, we've got a micro bat, it's a pest, someone come and remove it. If you've got a micro bat sitting around your place, you've got one of the best insect controls there are. They do like to make their homes in old roofs and old wall cavities, um, and they often live in a colony. There are microbat boxes around. There's certainly some suppliers quite local to here, and also if you Google, you'll find them. Um, before you start trying to eradicate them from your walls and your roofs, make sure you've got an alternate place for them. We do get quite a few calls during winter when someone has opened maybe an umbrella that hasn't been opened for a while or potentially looked in an old coat that's been sitting on the veranda since last winter and they kind of shake it out and this little object falls down at them. Microbats go into something that's known as torpor. So it basically means that they slow their body down to a point where they're kind of frozen. 
they're still alive, still well and truly alive, but they need to be warmed up to then basically reactivate. Really important with these guys, um, with any bat species, we don't advise handling them. There is a really, really, really small percentage of the population, like I'm talking minute, that does potentially carry the Australian bat lissa virus. Um, if you get bitten by a bat, all we say is go to your local doctor, make sure you get a rabies vaccination, you'll be fine. But obviously make sure that you do that. If you see a bat, call for help. We can advise microbats. I mean, you can see the size of its mouth compared to the size of my finger. Not likely to cause much damage, but you do need to handle these animals correctly. And realistically, if there is a shelter or foster care nearby, we would much prefer that they came and handled those animals rather than you did. Onto the feathered variety. Now I will say straight up and down that my shelter deals mainly with the third variety and there are some amazing shelters around that do just absolutely inspiring things with the birds. But in trueness and to make sure that we do cover all the different um, animal classes that we have around here, a bit about our feathered variety. So again, like um, our sepials, what they look at like when they hatch is not necessarily what they look like when they are adults. Really important with a lot of these bird species that they do in print um, and you want to get them to a licensed carer as soon as possible. But also on the other flip side, not all birds need to be rescued. So if you see a nestling that's fallen out of a tree, um, tawny frog males are a good one. They make atrocious nests and just a whiff of wind will have their hatchlings and fledglings on the ground. Like it doesn't take much at all. If you can see the nest, put them back in it. Mum and dad will be around. They can't smell. It doesn't matter that you've touched their young, just put them back. If it's obviously injured, then yes, call a wildlife rescue group, take it to a vet, any of the above, but especially in kind of our spring months when we've got all these learners on the ground trying to work out how to live basically, let them be. If mum and dad are around, just let them be unless you can see that they're injured. Really important that we don't get into a situation where all these youngsters are birdnapped and that is what happens every year. Shelters are bursting at the seams with baby magpies, oh, honey eaters, all of those little ones that, you know, we're really actually just doing their thing. If you have dogs and cats around where these guys are learning to fledge, then if you can even put buds up in a shrub, bring your cats and dogs away, they're not going to be on the ground for long. It's only a few days before they've worked out their top wings and then they can make short flights. We have a lot of different duck species. We have a lot of different um, ducklings. So the ducklings in the photo, you can see one's quite yellow and we've got a couple of grey ones. The yellow one is actually a Pacific black duck duckling and the greyer ones are Australian wood ducks. I did get called to a school many years ago because I had baby emus in the locker room. Would have been kind of cool, but no, they were definitely baby Australian wood ducks. Many, many, many other bird species around. We've got a lot of brands, we've got a lot of different honey eaters. If I tried to list every bird or any marsupial that we had in Victoria, then this seminar wouldn't be going for an hour, it'd be going for days. Going on from that, we certainly also have the ones with scales. Please don't touch the snake, just don't. Don't try and take its head off with a shovel. One, you're breaking the law and two, you're likely to be bitten. These snakes are in the area because there are amazing pest controls. They are in the area because there are rats and there are mice and there are great things to eat. You go one way, they will go the other. If they do end up being in a space that, you know, a house or somewhere where there is big concern, there are licensed snake catchers that are around. Keep an eye from a safe distance where that snake is and call your local snake catcher. They will come and remove the snake. Don't try and take his head off with a shovel. It doesn't show you that you're a great Aussie person. It just shows that you have absolutely no regard for our native wildlife. We have a lot of different um, skink and lizard species in Victoria. Again, if I listed every single one of them, we'd be here forever. Lots of blue tongues disguised as snakes. Um, I do enjoy the calls where I find out that a whole family has been bailed up in a room because there's a blue tongue in the kitchen. Um, they make a lot of noise. I guess they look scary to people who don't have a lot to do with them. 
Call it if you like wildlife groups or even a brave neighbour. If you definitely know it's got legs, they can come and remove it for you and just pop it back out in the garden. If you have veggie patches, if you have a whole heap of little um, seedlings that you're trying to keep alive, you want a blue tongue in your garden, they're going to keep your snails at bay. So now that you kind of have a bit of an overview about what we have around here, realistically, why should you care? Why are we going to use all these lamps to really make you understand what is around if you don't already? Australia is really unique. We have species in here that you will never find anywhere else in the world. And when they leave, there's no coming back. 87% of the mammal species found in Australia are found in Australia alone. We can't go to New Zealand, we can't go to America and pluck a koala from one of their gum trees and bring it back to Australia when we finish annihilating all their plantations and all their habitat and go, oh, oh that was glass koala. It sounds ridiculous that we will ever get to that point, but we're getting to that point far quicker than any of us really can imagine. 93% of the reptile species are only found here. 94% of the frog species are only found here and 45% of the birds are only found in Australia. We have, as a nation, one of the highest extinction rates in the world. And being a scientist in my other life, the world is just scratching their head going, what the hell are you guys doing? Like, you're not going to find a kangaroo anywhere else in the world. You're not going to find an echidna other than some of the other species that are found in New Zealand anywhere else in the world. Where else are you going to find a platypus? Like realistically, where are you going to find these animals once we have finished destroying our planet and go, oh, oh, that's right. We used to have cool stuff in our creeks and our streams and we used to go to these areas and see all these animals and we just don't see them anymore. We really need to care because if we don't care, no one else will. It's our wildlife. There's no coming back once they're gone. So the common reasons why wildlife do need help. Habitat loss. How many times has someone pruned back up a branch and a possum's gone, I was living there? Oops. Trees fall down. I'm sure a lot of you guys were affected like we were. With trees coming down, we were about power for two weeks and I, that was short compared to what a lot of you were facing. We know that it's not just us causing that habitat loss. We have had some really, really nasty storms that we've never had or it hasn't been around for a really long time. We have massive gum plantations that are grown and then our wildlife move in because they've got nowhere else to go. Just simply denuding a block of land. It was probably home to hundreds of little invertebrate species, so our insects probably home to quite a few of our younger, our little birds like our wrens, and it's just gone. There's nowhere for those animals to go. They are then constantly predated on, or they just die from starvation. There's no ability for them to evolve quick enough to change without environment. So really looking at if you are taking a tree down, well, that's okay, are there other trees around? Can we put a nest box up there for our local residents? There are so many calls for possums and roots. Well, of course they're in roots. Where else do you think they're going to live? So look at having nest boxes out in your property. Have a look at your space. Not all big blocks can obviously take big trees, but you could plant a really nice lush native garden for all those younger, all those little bird species that really rely on that nectar from those trees. Collision with vehicles. We'll go into this a little bit more because it is something that is quite scary for the person involved, but also there are ways and means to deal with the animals that have been confronted with this. We get a lot of the cases for um, attack and cruelty and fence entanglements. People think it's fun to spear arrows at cockatoos. Um, I'm not entirely sure which book of fun that is, but it does happen. People think it's hilarious if they just take pot shots at your local kangaroo population. I have a young Joey in care whose mob was illegally murdered and he was left in a paddock on a 36 degree day just screaming because his mum wouldn't answer him. That's not fair. They have more right to be here than us. If we can't live with them, we need to adjust how we're living. Fence entanglement doesn't just happen to kangaroos. 
that happens to all different species. We've had calls for birds of prey. We've had calls for the gliders that have been stuck in fences and usually the outcome is not good. There are really easy ways to negate some of the problems that fencing can cause. Fencing is a really important thing for a lot of us around here. I'm sure there's people here with livestock and the last thing you want is your cow walking onto the road. People need to keep their dogs in their properties, but there are ways and means that we can potentially modify those fences so it's safe for everyone. Disease, how many times have you seen a mangy wombat or a wombat that's been out in the day with massive patches of fur missing and just really not looking great? There's some amazing treatments for mange, but we also need to be realistic. If that wombat can't see, then there's no coming back from that. And unfortunately, sometimes the kindest thing we can do is to actually euthanize that animal. Natural disaster. I don't think any of us are gonna get the black summer that we had only a few, or a few years ago now. Massive heat stress events, storm events, the flooding that we've got, anything like that can potentially wipe out full populations of our wildlife. Orphaning, as, um, it can happen for a number of different reasons. It could be that a cat attacked a possum and her young survived, but she didn't. It could be that a kangaroo was chased by a dog. And unfortunately, when that happens, quite often the pouch young isn't manually tossed from the pouch, but the pouch becomes quite loose and the joey will often fall out and mum's so distressed that she just doesn't even know where to go back for that joey. And kidnapping or bird napping, fledgling season. It's where we get all these orphans in just with our old plates on. So for the general injured animals, um, the little brush tail possum joey up there, um, a dog thought he would be an amazing squeaky toy. It's just a really unfortunate turn of events. The owners hadn't realised that he had been fixated, the dog had been fixated on something in the garden. And when they went to investigate, they found this poor little chap. They were mortified. Accidents happen, these things happen, but it becomes an issue when you choose not to do anything about it. These guys did call for help. He got significant medical attention, but unfortunately the injuries were just too much. If you see an injured animal, you've got a really good chance to do something about it with the right equipment and the right knowledge. I am not gonna sit there and go, you need to go tackle that adult kangaroo that's probably 90 kilos because one of you is gonna get hurt and I can guarantee you the kangaroo's already hurt, it'll be you. But for your small, medium birds, mammals, lizards, don't touch a snake. And you can see an obvious injury, take it to the vet. As wildlife shelters and wildlife carers, we are volunteers. Most of us have to work full time to make ends meet. We don't always have the time to drop everything and run down to maybe a magpie that's got an obvious broken wing when realistically you could get a towel, a jumper, cover the animal up, scoop it up and take it to the vet. Most of our vets around here are amazing with wildlife. Please don't go to the vet and demand that they say things. They have the medical knowledge. These animals to be saved have to be able to go back out into the wild and function as an animal. There's so many times that we get told, oh, but it'll be okay. Like it's okay. It can live in it can live in captivity for the rest of its life. If you were an adult kookaburra that had never known anything other than the wild. Why would you think that it would be okay to then suddenly put it in a cage for the rest of its life? That's not fair. These animals are wild for a reason. They need to continue being wild. It's not just their physical state that we have to look after, it's their mental state. That is as important as everything else. Use a towel, use a jumper, use a blanket to cover the animal. Gently scoop it up. Make sure that you're aware where the bitey end is, especially in your likes of your possums. Um, Birds of prey, so even our smaller raptors, our booble cows, which are tiny, they have really sharp claws and nails on the end of those feet. Make sure they're securely wrapped in there. Place it in a box or if you're just in a car and you've got a passenger that can hold it, take it straight to the nearest vet. The larger marsupials, so our koalas and our macropods, so our kangaroos and wallabies, they can cause massive injury if approached the wrong way. There's a reason why koalas are given the nickname drop bears. They aren't as friendly as they seem. Their claws are designed to go up massive trees with a lot of, not a lot of grip and they can do the same thing to your leg. 
they also bite and they bite hard. And I'd put wombats into the same category. They may look cute, they run really quickly and they can cause a lot of damage if they want to. And they hurt, they hurt a lot if they bite. Call for help. There's going to be a wildlife rescue number at the very end, put it in your phone, have a look and see what they do. If looking after or rescuing animals is something that really starts to take your fancy, hopefully at the end of this, give them a call, they run training sessions. We're always looking for rescuers. We're always looking for transporters because those of us that run a shelter don't have the time necessarily to go out and rescue everything that needs rescuing. That's like I mentioned before, call a registered wildlife shelter or, or wildlife rescuers, which I'll give the number four for advice. Don't try and handle them yourself. So the road collisions. This is probably a good 80% of what we get phone calls for, for or what we see on Facebook. I would hope that photo tells you everything that you need to know. Everyone, we hear just so often, but it's a road they should know. Why should they know? They have no ability to realise these big bitumen things going through their habitat that once you to be joined is something that they shouldn't be going across. You wouldn't expect a toddler or a baby to know this. Why would you expect an animal to? And we know as wildlife shelters and carers that accidents happen. Our vision at night is not great. Our wildlife are out at night. It is going to happen. It doesn't mean that you're a horrible person if you hit an animal, but what makes you a horrible person is you choose not to do anything about it. So you've hit an animal or seen an animal that is deceased on the side of the road. You don't have to do anything, right? I'm not entirely sure how people can knowingly drive past a joey with its head hanging out of its dead mum's pouch and be okay with that. Because would you leave a child on the, on the road watching all those cars go around it going, ah, maybe one of them hit them, maybe one of them won't? Would you do that and not even call for help? Then why would you do that to our native wildlife? Understanding that not everyone can deal with an emergency or a crisis that goes out in front of them. There are people that just, they can't do that. And that's fine, that's okay. But everyone has a phone, call for help. If you are one of those amazing people who can put the gory aside and just focus on the task at hand, amazing. Here's a few things that can help you. And I tell you who's really good at this, kids. Oh my goodness. They are some of the most amazing wildlife warriors that we have because they just do it. They get the job done. They understand. Tia is that little Eastern Grey whose mum was hit by a car a few years ago. The person who hit her didn't stop. Someone who came past three hours later is the one who called. Tia was lucky she wasn't sitting in the middle of the road. If you are able to pouch check, stay calm. You're going to be running on adrenaline in your first few. You just are. It's just the way it goes. Make sure you're aware of what is around you. Don't inspect the animal in the middle of the road. We don't need a squished human as well. We just don't. It's not a good look. When it's safe to do so, especially if you've got a few other people who stop, who can kind of monitor the traffic for you, or if it's in a really, really bad place, call the police, call Vic Roads and get someone out to help you. Animals on the road cause as much damage to cars as anything else. So we want that animal off the road, whether it something can be done for it or not. So when it's safe to do so, move it off the road, especially if it's deceased. Kangaroos have this amazing thing called a tail. It's phenomenal as something to move an animal with. When you have the animal on the side of the road, if it hasn't given you any uh, grief trying to get it off the road, then look for signs of life. Animals are exceptionally resilient beings and can be alive through the most traumatic injuries. Check for the movement of eyes. Do they twitch at all? Is there any muscle movement around? Remembering that if an animal is just dying, then they are also going to have muscle movement as well. Just watch their chest. Is it moving? Is it moving slightly? In especially in a macropod, you'll be able to see the chest go up and down if it's breathing, but you also may see the heart palpitate. And listen, is there vocalization? Is there some noises happening? And you know what, those noises may not be from the actual animal you're looking at, it may be coming from the pouch. 
when you have determined that it is deceased, if it's not, call for help. One of us will come. It may take a little bit, but one of us will be there. Turn the animal onto its back. It really should be obvious in our marsupial species if it's male or female. The boys have testes. The girls have a pouch. In the non-breeding females, it can be really hard to find a pouch, kind of look the way you'd expect a belly button to be. It's probably the easiest way to describe it. But not all pouches are the same, just to really keep everyone on their toes. We don't like to make these things easy. So when we were looking for a pouch, where are they? So our kangaroos, I would suspect most people know where a pouch is. Images have been around forever, forever with the kangaroos and joeys in pouches. Our koalas have a similar spot where the pouches are. The brush tail possum on the bottom, um, I think that's me extracting one of our younger juveniles out. You'll actually be able to see, hopefully in that brush tail, that the baby's holding onto something. That's actually its mother's teeth. Really important that if you do see um, a joey attached to a teeth, that you don't yank it off. It can cause absolutely just so much damage to that joey's mouth. There are other ways around um, doing that. This possum, dead possum came to me with the joey in the pouch because whoever found mum wasn't comfortable getting the joey out of the pouch. That's fine. We would much prefer as wildlife carers to have the whole mum and joey come to us if you're not comfortable moving that pouch young properly than getting a pouch young and finding that its mouth is just smashed because someone's been a little bit too tough trying to rip it off its mum's teeth. Wombats love to keep everyone on their toes. Um, we would call your kangaroo and your koala pouches um, forward opening, so they're opening towards the head of the animal. Wombats have a backwards opening pouch. Specifically designed, they're designed to burrow. If I had a forward opening pouch and I was a wombat, my pouch I would just get drowned in dirt every time I dug a burrow. They are also really hard to manoeuvre. Um, wombat joey extractions is probably one of the hardest things that you'll ever do because it's a really small hole that these joeys seem to be able to fit in and they really, really, really don't want to get out of it. Um, there are methods of doing it. Um, some people will be okay with it, other people won't be, and that's fine. So now we know where the pouch is. Now, now what do we do? We can see there's a pouch, we can see there's a youngster. This is where realistically you have the chance to save another bean's life. As we said before, take the mother safely off the road. Make sure that you are aware of your surrounds. Please don't get squished in the process. Pouches can be really hard to access, especially if the animal has gone into rigor mort mortis or they're stiff, in other words. If you can't access the pouch easily and you are comfortable doing this, then we do recommend cutting the pouch, making sure that your hand is between those scissors and the baby. And obviously make sure mum is dead. She is not going to appreciate your surgical techniques if she is alive. Fearless or just fur joeys have their lips fused. Um, hopefully you would have, you may have noticed with that brush tail in the previous slide, but it was well and truly attached to that teeth. Whilst he wasn't fused to that teeth, um, he was only just coming out from that stage. Moving or ripping the animal off their teeth can cause damage. So again, if you're comfortable doing so, we do recommend cutting the teeth. Mum is dead. She's not going to feel it. Um, you're not going to have a whole heap of things gushing out at you, despite what media love to say. There is no marsupial that you are going to rescue that you are doing a C-section for. If you're doing a C-section, you've cut too far and it's not going to be pleasant for any of you. You will never have to go into an internal cavity of an animal to rescue a pouch young. It's a complete, it's almost like an envelope attached to the animal. We recommend cutting the teeth off as close to mum as you're comfortable. And then if you've got something, a hair clip, a bobby pin, a safety pin, even a hair tie, wrap it around the end of that teeth so the joey doesn't inhale it. It's unlikely to happen, but it's a really stressful um, process for everyone involved. So obviously the only comfort that this joey knows is it's mum's teeth. So they're gonna want as much of it as they can. Wrap the joey, and a joey can be a possum joey, it can be a re joey, it can be a wombat joey, they're all called joeys. Wrap them carefully and securely in a pillowcase, in a t shirt, anywhere that you can. We ask that they're secure because the less movement that they can make, the less stress they are. You will have noticed with the mum's pouch, it's exceptionally tight around that joey. That is what makes them feel safe and secure. 
keep them warm, place them down your top if they're small enough, um, drive to the nearest carer or if no care available, take it to the nearest vet. Most of the vets around here have a really good network of carers that they deal with and one of us will get a phone call going, we've just had this coming, can you come and get it? Please don't have the music blaring when you've got a, a young animal or even an injured animal in the car. Please don't smoke around it. Smoke is not good for us, it's certainly not good for them. Don't allow your kids to pat it, take photos with it. This animal has just been through one of its worst days in its life and the last thing it needs is a child poking it, going, look, mum, look, make, make it move. And don't give it to your dog to curl up with. Keep it quiet, keep it dark, keep it warm and get it to a carer. It's all very well saying how to look for a pouch young and how to extract a pouch young, but nothing tells you more so how to do this than watching a video. So the next video does have a deceased kangaroo in it. Um, realistically, you really can't see anything. A lot of her is covered, but it shows a really nice way of removing a joey from the pouch. This joey's had already dropped the teat from mum, so there isn't any movement from the joey in terms of taking it off its teat. The video is supplied by Dutch Funder Wildlife Shelter, which is a wildlife shelter in country Victoria, and it does feature Libby, who some of you may know from Libby's Koala and Wildlife Crusade. Really thankful that Kylie and Libby have allowed us to use this video. Um, it's a really, I say nice, um, in a key sense of words, it's a very nice, clear way of showing you how to remove a power shovel. So this female had been hit on the freeway and they'd moved her off. It's only a young female, so even quite small kangaroos can carry pouch young. As you can see Libby is carefully opening that pouch and when they zoom in, you'll see the youngster in there. So this is a young Eastern Grey um, with the right caring, um, perfectly viable, um, but According to our government guidelines, she's not, but according to 99.9% .9 of the care population, that animal is completely viable to be rehabilitated and released into the wild. You can hear that little crying, that's Bob's calling. So this is one of the main reasons we want to get them into a pouch or something secure straight away because it's a really stressful experience. Libby's going to put the pouch and pouch on straight up the top and that way Bubs is quite close to a heart, she can perform movement and that's really important for these little tuckers. Um, I can, the video will be on the slide pack, so I'm sure Jen will be able to um, look that free to anyone who wants to have a look. Um, we looked for the joey, we found the joey, what do we do next? Realistically, there's not a huge amount more that you need to do. You can go drop the animal off to a registered shelter and go pour yourself a drink if that's what you really need to do. If there's no joey or you've removed the joey, make sure you have removed the animal off the road. We don't want other people hitting it, um, not only for the animal, but also for people's property. Um, if you have got spray paint in the car, we do recommend spraying the animal with a cross. You may or may not have seen animals sprayed with a cross and questioned why we do it. It's basically to stop every other man and their dog stopping to check that same animal. Um, we tend to spray over, if it's a male, um, over its testicle region because there are people who are known to hack these off. Um, it, yeah, that's my personal preference to keep an animal entire. Um, what other people do is their business. If you don't have spray paint or you just prefer not to and that's completely fine too, just make sure the animal isn't visible from the road. All it does is stop us having to then check every animal that has already been checked or also scratch our head going, we know this animal should have a joey in its pouch because of its teeth, where is it? So I've kind of dragged on about what to do when you see an injured animal. A few what not to do. If you see an animal crossing the road or you've seen an animal on the road, don't break suddenly. You're not gonna wanna cause a pile up if it's slippery, if it's wet, then you also don't want to find yourself wrapped around a tree. Don't swerve. Animals will always, well, I say always, they're independent beings. They should go straight across, unless of course they're on the verge of a road or they're a kangaroo, in which case they really do enjoy causing a lot of grief and trying to zigzag all over the traffic. When it's safe to do so, slow down, come to a stop. 
put your hazards on so others know that there's something on the road. Don't stop on a crest of a hill. If you can't be seen, there's nothing stopping the person that's coming up behind you, slamming into you. Don't run across a busy road, especially in fogs or in inappropriate footwear. We don't want you squished as well. For me, an animal life is so important, but there is a family that will miss you a lot if something was to happen to you, and we don't want that either. Don't check an animal when you're both on the road. Move it off the road if you can. If it's alive, call the police, call a wildlife group to help. Don't attempt to rescue a live, injured adult, marsupial, um, macropod, wombat, koala on your own, unless you've got an experienced rescuer on the phone, unless you've got a shelter on the phone, unless you have the physical ability and equipment and knowledge to do so. And probably one of the most important things don't keep the animal because you're attached to it. You rescue that animal, that is amazing. That is where your job ends. I cannot tell you how many joeys that I have been given and been told, oh no, we've just picked it up. And I'm looking at this joey going, there's no way in hell you've just picked this up. This joey is showing me all the signs that you've had it in for at least a week and I can put money on the fact that you were feeding it cow's milk. It's not a pet for your child. It's not a learning exercise for your child to raise one of our native wildlife. If you're really, really keen to raise wildlife and understand that wildlife must be wildlife and they must be released back to the wild, then have a chat to your local shelter, have a chat to the department and see how you can become involved. And most importantly, and I've probably said it about a billion one times now, don't stop if there's nowhere safe to do so. Pull over further down the road, make a U-turn, make a call. So a few other reasons why we do get these guys into care, which is not just from the roads and everything else. Bird napping. Little magpies, little magpie larks. A lot of our honey eating species, they go for a period where they're hopping on the ground. It's normal. This is what they do to learn. Is the baby bird in danger? Is there a cat stalking it? Well, put the cat away. Is there a dog who reckons it's going to need an amazing squeaky toy? Put the dog away. If you can't do that, have you got a front yard that the cats and dogs haven't got access to? Is it quite close by? Move the baby bird into that area. Keeping in mind that if mum and dad are around, you are likely to get swooped because you're stealing their kid. If there's nowhere safe for the baby to be, make a nest. It doesn't have to be elaborate. Use an ice cream tub container, something similar to that. Cut down a pot plant holder. Make sure there's drainage holes in these containers because obviously if it rains, we don't want them drowning. Pop it up into a tree. Just because you've touched that baby bird does not mean that mum and dad aren't coming back to it. They can't smell. Don't handle it, take it inside, pretend that it's a pet. Um, I think there's a, there was a movie called Penguin or something about a magpie that was raised by people. Please don't. These guys are wild. They need to be wild. Unless this bird is injured, the best place for this baby bird to be is with its parents, learning the ropes of the wild from someone who can teach them far better than any human possibly can. We know that there's people who feed native wildlife. I could say to one blue on the face to stop, and I know that 90% of the population is just not going to listen. Please, if you feel the absolute need that you have to feed wildlife, really think about what you're doing for that wildlife. You're actually not helping it. Many of the meat speak, um, substitutes that people feed our birds, such as magpies, kookaburras, it depletes the animals so much in calcium that it actually then kills the offspring. Or it means that there's so much damage to their legs, to their wings, that these young birds will never survive in the wild. Feeding our parrot feed is a whole heap of seed. A little bit of seed every now and then is okay, but do you really want these animals to be so reliant on you that if you move, they can't live? We also have a massive problem with a disease called beacon feather in parrots, and quite often that's caused because people are feeding animals in an area and we have a lot of birds in that area. Beacon feather is contagious. It spreads through a whole population. Do you really want to be responsible for that? because there's no coming back from beacon feather. It is a euthanasia. So with all that doom and gloom, and I can guarantee you, I have not covered every reason that you will find an animal in care. 
that needs care and that's fine but hopefully it gives you a bit of a basis as to our common reasons why we do get those calls there are a lot of things that you can do to make a positive dis difference for our wildlife things that you could actually you could just do at home it doesn't take a lot of money and realistically the wildlife will thank you for it and so will I, so will we because we don't have the numbers that need to come into care so making a positive difference I'm not sure how aware many of you are, but from the 1st of September 2021, um, a lot of netting that people use in their gardens and on fruit trees is actually now classed as illegal. And it's quite a significant monetary fine if people are found to have these fruit netting. There are other netting that is available. Um, the netting must be the size of the netting must be five millimetres or less at full stretch. So when you pull that netting out, how big are those holes? How about you look at sharing some of your fruits of your labour? Use the sleeves that we've got in that photo. I'm fairly certain Bunnings sell them and I'm almost positive you can make them up yourself. That way you can tie off a whole heap of different branches and they're for you. I don't know about you, but the last thing I would ever want to come out to is a lorikeet or any other species wrapped up in my netting and knowing full well that the injuries that I have actually personally caused that animal is going to mean that that animal's life is terminated. When you do dispose of your old netting, make sure you don't just throw it away, throw it in the bush. People do weird, weird, stupid things, and that's probably one of them. Put them in, put the old netting in big biodegradable bags and take it down to the tip or dispose of it through your garbage, whichever way you wish to, because just a bundle of netting can be just as bad as netting on trees. I say hundreds of animals are caught in netting and may per perish in Victoria. I would probably suspect there's more thousands. Hundreds are just the ones that we know about. Um, if you do have an animal entangled in netting, please call for help. Whilst you know that you haven't done the right thing in terms of having that netting. Don't let that animal suffer because of that. Call one of us in to help. You might get a lecture about why you shouldn't have the netting, but realistically, that's all that's going to happen unless we see that it's time and time again, in which case, yeah, we will probably report. But if it's a once-off, you haven't had a chance to remove the netting and something gets caught, please call a wildlife rescue group so we can deal with that animal as soon as possible. Many bats that get caught in netting are lactating females. They don't have their pups with them all the time. They're, they get left in camps. That means that not only have we potentially lost a female bat in the population, which is really important, we're also gonna lose its pup because there is no way that we will know which pup is hers. So the quicker we can get these animals out of the netting, the more chance we have, have of rehabilitating them or the injuries that are sustained aren't bad, the more chance we are of getting any of these animals back out into the wild ASAP. Next thing is our fencing. I touched on it a little while ago. I'm not going to sit here and say that people shouldn't have properties unfenced because realistically a roaming cat, dog or, or livestock is just as dangerous to wildlife as, it is, as the fencing is. Barbed wire is what some people will argue are necessarily um, addition to a fencing. I would argue that there's many other ways to keep cattling. Um, and barbed wire just causes so much trauma to our native wildlife. Sugar gliders, squirrel gliders, a little bit further up north. A lot of our birds of prey who don't see the wire when they're out hunting at night get caught in this wire and it's damaging. It is so damaging to these animals and rarely do we have a good success rate in getting them back out into the wild because the damage is so bad. The stranded wire that you'll see in a lot of properties, especially the top couple of strands, can be really dangerous to some of our macropod species, our kangaroos and our wallabies. We have a term called fence hanging. It's basically where the first two top wires flip on itself. If an animal taps it, it flips and then catches its foot in there. Again, if we don't get to that animal really quickly, the chances of being successful in rehabilitation is really slim to almost none. We get a lot of joys about the four to six kilo age rate that gets stuck in fencing because they haven't quite got the height that mum and dad have, but they give it a red hot go and then they come unstuck. If removing wire and fencing isn't an option, replace the top fence wire with a white plastic coated wire or even coloured tape to increase visibility. 
a lot of the time it's simply because these animals don't see that wire. If you can cover your top wire with poly pipe, if it's, especially if it's barbed wire and you don't want to remove that fencing, cover it with poly pipe. I'm sure people, hard rubbish is coming up. I'm sure there's plenty of people throwing stuff out. Have at least a 50 centimetre gap between the ground and the lowest wire. It means a lot of our reefs that can't go over the wire can go under it. We live in massive wildlife corridors. We need to make sure those corridors exist. Um, it also stops wombats from making every hole under the sun to try and get free because we all know wombats are stubborn and no matter what we do, they will go back to that same place. So just make it easier on yourself. Let them have a pass through. There are some amazing wildlife gates that have been invented and they're all over Facebook, all over Google. Have a bit of a look because they are specifically designed to let wildlife go through and stop to stay where they need to be. Keep the wires at least 30 centimetres between. It stops the, I'm not going to say it stops, it reduces the chances that we have the fence hanging injuries like the photo of the kangaroo on the right hand side. Make your gardens wildlife friendly. Keep your cats inside. This is not just for the wildlife's sake, it's for your cat's sake too. Do you really want your cat involved in arguments with the neighbourhood tabby? Do you really want your cat to suddenly be pregnant because the local tomcat who is a stray has done what he needs to do? There are a lot of people who say wildlife carers and wildlife shelters don't like domestic pets. I have a cat. He's not allowed anywhere near my wildlife and he's inside. He has an outside run and he's perfectly happy with that. I know that he has no road sense. I know he would be one of those cats that would walk out to the road and go look at me and flop on the ground and then someone would appear. We have birds of prey around here. Depending on how big your cat is, they may also be seen as a very nice, a tasty snack. There are diseases that cats can get if they run into trouble outside. If you really do truly love your cat, keep it inside, build a cat run. It is better for your cat, it is better for our native wildlife. Our native wildlife were here first. Join programs if you want some ideas such as Yarra Rangers Gardens for Wildlife. I do believe there's a bit of a wait for this, but there are Facebook groups that you can join to get some ideas. Especially with our changing climate, make sure that you have some safe places for our local native residents to take a drink. These are just a few photos of the water stations that I have around my place. Granted, they're not particularly clean at the moment. It's good old storms have been creating a bit of havoc, but they are all away from where any domestic pet can get to them. I've got some on the ground for so our ground dwelling species like our lizards. There's some that are a little bit higher up and I see my wrens in it all the time. And then we've got a, a small pond which has got a few frogs happening in it at the moment. Really important with any water source that you have either branches or some stones in there. It means that the smaller critters, if they fall in, they can get back out. The last thing that we really want is to be bright, providing these awesome places for animals to drink. But if they were to have a bath and you couldn't get out and then they drown, it's just, it's not pleasant. It's not pleasant for anyone. So really think about what area you've got it in. Is it under shade? Is it out of direct sunlight? There's no point providing water if all it's going to do is boil in the middle of the day. Make sure that you're topped up quite regularly. Keep it cleaner than these containers are at the moment. And enjoy. Set up a couple of cameras. It's amazing. I have never seen so many birds in my garden on a hot day when these water sources are out and full. Plant, 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 plant. Doesn't have to be massive gum trees, although we would love some more gums in the Yarra Valley. Lots of natives. There are some amazing Indigenous native nurseries around here. There's some amazing commercial nurseries around here who sell native plants. Grevilleas are amazing, but what grevilleas do is they introduce a food source for a lot of our larger, more aggressive honey eaters and it drives a lot of our smaller birds out. So a variety. Make sure you've got your native grasses, you've got some grevilleas, you've got your clistamins, you've got your coriers, all those different species. It's going to be amazing what you can attract into your garden. And provide artificial nesting sites. They're is so much habitat loss around, the least we can do is provide them a place to live. So there's 
many different places around that you can use. Um, Corongra off the top of my head, I know sell nesting boxes, but your local men's shed probably would sell them too. Have a look around. Try and make your garden as friendly for native wildlife as possible. Try and keep your local introduced rat species to a minimum. By doing so, by creating a garden fit for wildlife, you're actually going to do that without even knowing it. And respect our native wildlife. At the end of the day, they were here first. We have gone into their habitat. We have changed their habitat to make our homes. The least we can do is provide a place for them as well. So that does actually bring me to the end of my presentation. I'm really sorry, Jen. I've probably taken like 20 billion more years than you expected. Um, but just to summarise, wildlife carers, wildlife shelters, we are volunteers. We have a life. Many of us have multiple juveniles that are on bottle feeds, and it means that we can't drop everything to come and race because your cat has decided to bring in a possum. We will come and help when we can, but realistically, that's not our fault. You've created that situation. We can talk you through how to fix it, but just don't expect us to drop everything and run because nine times out of 10, we just can't. Keep in mind that it does cost us a lot of money to do this. Um, we don't get paid for this. Our government in true form would much prefer wildlife never came into care. We know that they're trying to change regulations and legislation for that to be the case. Our native wildlife come into strife because of humans. The least we can do is get those animals back out into the wild. We know that these animals can re be rehabilitated successfully with the right enclosures, with the right knowledge. You would never raise a kangaroo jolly by itself. You would never raise a kangaroo jolly to depend on a human for the rest of its life. I know that I go out to the release sites that I use for my next lot of releases. And if my previous releases are kind of still floating around, they want nothing to do with me. In fact, if I approach them, they go the other way. Hurts a little bit, but actually it's amazing. It means that I have done what I need to do. I have created an animal that is well aware of what it is and where its place is in life. Chat to your local shelters, see how you can help. Don't be confronted when they say, honestly, it's money, because at the end of the day, we can get medical bills that we weren't expecting and those donations are what help fund that. See if you've got um, wildlife shelters around you. Maybe you could pick some native foliage for the animals in care. Our possums, our gliders, our roos, our wombats, everything needs native food because we want them to recognise what native food is. And you know what? If you've got a property that backs onto state national forest and that you really do enjoy the wildlife, maybe you could be one of our release sites. We are desperately looking for release sites everywhere where we can set up an aviary, set up a pen and allow a safe place for that animal to be reunited with wild. Remind your local state and federal government how important our native wildlife are. It's not just the bushfires that cause billions of lives every year. We do it every day. Our state government, the same department that licenses us as wildlife shelters, also hand out culling permits for native wildlife like they are candy. There is a lot of problems with our licensing system. There's a lot of problems with how our government see our native wildlife. Our native wildlife have more right to be here than we do. We need to live harmoniously with them. And finally, don't keep an injured orphan or displaced wildlife. Hand them to a shelter ASAP not when your child gets sick of playing with it because effectively you've killed that animal. That's me done. There is an amazing group called Wildlife Rescuers Incorporated. Their number is on the slide. If you need rescue advice, if you're interested in learning how to become a rescuer, then give them a bell. They're an amazing supportive group, um, really transparent in what they do and really, really great at mentoring new rescuers that come through. And if you have a chance, our shelter is Bungalow Creek Wildlife Shelter. We are based just in Mount Evelyn and our Facebook page is there. So thank you so much. Over to you, Jen. 
Thank you so much, uh, Emma. That was absolutely fantastic. Really, really loved it. it. Your passion, your knowledge, your dedication is really, really clear. And I'm, I'm just really grateful to you spending your time teaching us all today, but also just looking after the wildlife as, you, as you've been doing for, I think you said, 15 years or so. So yeah, thank you so much. And everyone else, um, I've put that number in my, my phone just now. So make sure you do as well. So that's in case anyone can't see it, 0417. 506941. So make sure you pop that number into your phones. Um, we do have a few questions coming in. So if there's any other questions you want to add, please put them in the QA. Also, the QA is a cool little function that has a um, little thumbs up. So if there's a question you like, give it a thumbs up and then it pushes it to the top of the screen, then I get to see it. So that's really cool. Um, so on that, uh, Jan wanted to know. Um, you were talking about the rat pellets earlier and the issues with rat pellets and, and creatures eating them. Do possums eat those? Yeah, massively. We, especially in winter, we generally get a lot of possums that come in with poisoning. So it's not just specific for rats, it's also specific for the possums as well. I mean, it's not a good thing to poison your possums, but it also that poison does go through the milk supply as well. So if that possum has joeys on board, it will also kill the joey. Um, it's okay. also illegal. It's illegal to knowingly poison our native wildlife. All right, excellent. Thank you. That's good advice. Um, Martina wanted to know when you were talking about moving the kangaroos off the road and how you could pull them by the tail. Um, if the kangaroos are alive, pulling it by the tail, does that create any other problems or any other issues? Please don't, Please don't pull a live kangaroo off the road by the tail. Um, yeah, you're likely to lose your head. They, their, their foot can be hanging off and they will still be able to kick it. Their tail is an except, exceptionally strong muscle in its body. If the animal is still alive on the side of the road or in the middle of the road, do what you can to try and prevent it being hit and call for help. The Victorian police, especially around here, realistically, if an animal's been hit on the road, an adult animal's been hit on the road, the chances that the animal can be saved is not high. It's really not. That is the reality of the situation. It's a very large piece of metal that has come towards that animal. Um, especially if you can see that limbs aren't kind of facing in the direction that they should be anymore. It really is kinder for that animal to be euthanized as soon as possible. If the animal's still relatively mobile, yeah, give us a call because you know it may have a fractured pelvis that with some care it can go back out. Um, or if you just don't know, call someone because we wouldn't, we don't ask and we don't want you to be making that call yourself without that knowledge. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, Hayley wants to know, what would you recommend we keep in our cars to be prepared to help an animal we, we may find on the road? So is there like a little kit we can put together yeah. for our cars? So disposable gloves, they're around everywhere at the moment thanks to COVID. Um, some baby wipes to sanitize your hands afterwards because, you know, it's not always pleasant. Um, I would recommend having a small pair of scissors in your car, uh, a towel, blanket, anything like that. If you've got a cardboard box that your car's big enough and you can keep it flattened until you need it, amazing. Um, there's plastic picnic baskets around that we use all the time called Rio baskets. They're great because they're secure. Um, anything like that is fine. Um, but yeah. If you have no room in your car and the only thing you can fit in is one object, a blanket, blanket or a towel. Excellent, thank you. That's great, that's great information. Um, someone wanted to know, is there a humane way of deterring a wombat from digging under vital buildings? <laughs> Wombats are stubborn. They're really stubborn. So we certainly understand that wombats can cause a lot of damage. Like 100% they can cause a lot of damage. Um, and especially depending on the area that you're in, there are ways of stopping that wombat from going back under. So wombats, whilst they're stubborn, they're not particularly bright. So if you've got a building that you can run what we call as belly wire, so you attach some wire to the top of the structure, you run it down, you kind of make it look like an L and make it go out onto the ground, dig it out, dig it down a little bit. You just need to come out maybe half a metre to a metre out in the ground because the wombat will always go to the point where it's trying to enter and it's usually the entry point right at the side of the building and they get frustrated really quickly. Don't try and tr don't try and block a burrow until you know that there's no couch young left in the burrow because wombats in particular will actually leave their young in the burrow and go off and forage and then come back. So if there is an animal, a wombat underneath 
the house and you do have the mechanism to actually block it from going back under or a shed or whatever it is, grab one of those motion cameras, they're not that expensive, set it up and you'll see pretty quickly she's coming back for a pouch jam because you don't want to be trapping a baby in there because you don't want to come up against a really angry wombat who's trying to get back to its bob. Absolutely, good advice. Yeah, yeah, wombats can be a little bit crazy sometimes. <laughs> uh, we have someone else saying that they, they have wild ducks and magpies that eat their chicken pellets from the chook shed. Is that a problem? They leave the chook shed open because they're chooks free range. Um, what can Is there an issue with the wild animals eating those chook pellets? It's kind of happened, it really is. Like I would strongly suggest if you've got chickens, you can do those um, self feeders where they stand on a hopper and it opens. Not so much that you're probably going for a lot of money in feeding every other animal underneath the sun. Also having a lot of chook food lying around, you are going to be introducing, uh, providing a really good environment for you to introduce rats and mice. Um, so while it's not ideal, it's certainly just one of those things in life. But yeah, if you can get automatic feeders for your chooks, one, it'll save you money in the long run. Um, and two, it'll yeah probably clean up any extra bits and pieces that the introduced mice and rats like. That's a great, great answer. Yeah, I used to have the same problem when I used to have chooks, so I'll remember that when we get them again. Yes, <laughs> Um, Tina wants to know a bit about um, mange, mange on wombats. Is there a sort of a way to report it? And um, is there an instance of mange in other wildlife? Yeah, so mange, um, while we see it predominantly in wombats, um, foxes can get it, your domestic dogs can get it, um, and koalas can get it. So koalas and wombats are incredibly closely related. Um, and it's caused by a little mite. Um, humans can get it as well. Um, but it doesn't seem to live on us, which is quite nice to know. There are really quite a number of stages of mange and there's varying views as to the treatability. Um, there is a group going around called Mange Management um, Program. Having look in, looking at the latest research that's coming in, Cydectin, which is what is generally used, doesn't really treat it anymore. We kind of move more towards the Brevecto, which is a canine um parasite control it's not cheap but it actually works really really well if you see a young wombat so i'm talking about the size of footballish thereabouts with mange call it into one of your local wildlife shelters chances are the reason that joey's got mange is actually because it's compromised because of orphaning not necessarily because of any other reason and they have a really really good um chance of being rehabilitated if caught early enough they're are a lot of instances where mange has actually been misdiagnosed and it's actually from dog attack. Um, a very similar presentations. Um, the only difference is, is if you really look at those wounds, they're actually punch marks rather than mange scabs. Wouldn't be expecting just your general Joe blog to know that. Um, wildlife carers do though, and it's one of the first things we look for is, is it actually mange or has this animal been attacked? Um, we need to be realistically realistic in the fact that once mange gets to a certain point, no matter how much we might be monitoring that animal or how much we are putting um, antiparasites on it, it's not going to live and you're actually causing immense pain and suffering to these animals. Um, if you can see an animal with more than 50% of its um, body just completely scabbed and oozing and flies hanging around it, if you can see that the animal's eyes are shut and it's just so crusted over that it's actually not seeing, then the reason this animal is out during the day is because it's not physically able to eat enough to keep its body going. And we really have to tread that line of cruelty and really looking to see what is best for that animal. Um, so there's no hard and fast reason, but any of your local shelters that deal a lot with wombats, if you send them a photo, they can tell you pretty quickly. Excellent. And I should point out, actually, the uh, mange management group, we are actually trying we've been trying for a while now to get them to do a webinar for us they're really keen it's just a matter of timing and trying to organize around different things but uh, yeah we will definitely be having a mange management wombat um, uh, webinar at some point later this year I'm hoping the autumn so if that is something that interests you keep an eye out what you what you'll also notice we will send out an email in a few days and there's an option to sort of stay signed up to our newsletter so if you if you sign yourself up to that if you're not already then you'll stay on our list and you'll get an email whenever we get a new uh, webinar coming out or another event. 
Um, Joanne here has a question about, uh, she wanted to know a little bit more about, you talked about government legislation and wildlife shelters and what are they trying to introduce? Yeah, so we, as registered wildlife shelters and foster carers, we are governed by the Wildlife Rehabilitation, I think it's the Wildlife Rehabilitation Act, I may have the terminology a little bit wrong. So that actually governs what we can and can't um, legally rehabilitate. Unfortunately, a lot of the knowledge base that this legislation is based on isn't actually through real life experience. Um, we are told quite often and only in the last few days that there's new legislation potentially coming through that means that effectively we cannot remove any native animal from its natural habitat, which in theory is fine, except if we're talking about a two kilogram Eastern Grey Joey who is in its natural habitat, but its mum's dead. So there is no way, there is no way that two kilogram kangaroo joey will survive. And effectively we have been told that that's okay, it just needs to die. I am not entirely sure with any good conscience how we leave a, effectively a baby to cry for days while it slowly dies. Wildlife carers, and whilst I'm not talking about all of them, I can only talk for myself. We have a lot of knowledge. We've been doing this for a long time. We understand that there are many stages these wildlife have to go back to. And our end goal is to get a fully functioning animal back to the wild, who knows it's wild, who knows what species it is. I will stand hand on heart saying, the last thing that I want my kangaroos to do is to approach a human. Humans can be lovely people. They can also not be. It's so really important. I know that there's probably several of you on here that have raised kangaroo joys in the past because that's what kind of happened. And that's, you know, that's okay because we didn't have the knowledge then. But if kangaroos are raised in isolation and raised as a pet, then that pet becomes a 90 kilogram male who can do a lot of damage. So it's so, so important that these wildlife are raised properly. And unfortunately we have a government who, like I mentioned before, hands out a culling license to all of our native species like lollies and they're the same ones that govern us. We are doing a lot of work to try and show them that we do actually know what we're doing. I mean, I run a shelter, I've run it for 15 years. I also have a doctorate in zoology. We're not these dumb people that our government like to make us out to be. Most of us have a fair whack of education and knowledge behind us. And I don't wanna see these animals kept as pets. If I kept these animals as a pet, I'd be up to like 3,000 animals by now. God, they cost me enough as it is. I'm not feeding 3,000 animals, I have space. Um, so it's really important to support your local wildlife shelters, find out what's happening, have a look at the legislation. And really, we really need to start lobbying our government. They really enjoy doing the smokes and mirrors during the fires. They look at how great we are, aren't we a wonderful? Truth is they weren't, they didn't sweet crap all. They prevented trained, knowledgeable carers to help in the fire grounds so that they could just go kill everything, except for the koalas, which they made a song and dance about, to the point where most of us actually got deployed by government, by other not-for-profit organisations into New South Wales to help them, which is just, just ridiculous. So really have a look at the legislation. I know that the, protect, the Prevention of Cruelty to Animal Act is undergoing a review at the moment. Um, and realistically, just Keep your ear to the ground, like for us to make a change and to make a difference and to be realistically realistic in what is right for these animals. We need the support of, of you as the public because without your support, we're just seen as this small group and, you know, it's our native wildlife. If we don't look after them, who is? So hopefully that's kind of given you a bit of an idea. Um, there is going to be legislation up and around. Um, you can certainly pull it out if I need to. Yeah, Jan wanted to know, do you know the name of the legis proposed legislation? Uh, yeah, so it is still sitting underneath the Prevention of Cruelty to Animal Act and it's been segregated to wildlife and care or something to that effect. Right, excellent. And we had another person saying that there was a uh, 
sort of activist group called the Sum of Us, who um, have a big reach in making gather signatures to prevent legislation. So I don't know if you know about that. I'll send you that info. Yeah, that. no, I don't. Um, yeah, I recently have. So there's a group called the Kangaroo Alliance, which really came up. It's been around for a little while, but it really came up with the Kinley Kangaroo thing. And can I say hand on heart, thank you so much for all the support that we got with that because those groups are now safe. Um, and that is because of you, of the public, of council backing us and going, no, this is not right. Like we don't get to develop something and just decimate everything that's in there. Like we actually have to have a plan. So, and those animals are fine. They are safe um, and they are doing well. Excellent. Um, and one more question. Well, there's a couple of questions coming in about this. I will just say we've got about five more minutes. So if you've got any other burning questions, get them in now. I'll see if I can get as many answered with Emma as possible. But otherwise, uh, if you do have any questions, feel free to email them to me. My email will be sent out to you uh, in a few days. Or obviously, go on to Emma's uh, Bungalow Creek Wildlife Shelter Facebook, and you can see all the work she's there. And I'm sure, Emma, you won't mind if people pop in a couple of questions uh, yeah, to funny. post yeah. some things there. So yeah, I will try and get these answered. Um, someone wanted to know about the kangaroo, what, what are your thoughts on the kangaroo overpopulation issue and solutions? And do you think that this government legislation was aimed towards that when leaving joeys to die? Um, I would say yes, yeah, probably. Um, I would turn that around and go, whilst I certainly don't disagree that our kangaroo population has increased in certain areas, we have pushed them into smaller pockets. So we know that the kangaroo population, especially around here and out towards your little sea kangaroo grounds in Andrews has been decimated to the point where we're having pet food hunters, the field people stores go, hey, we see a mob of kangaroos they can shoot. So we know that the kangaroo population itself has declined significantly. But we're also aware that because of the spread in urban growth, they are now found in areas in perceived greater numbers, but it's more that they don't have that space to go. Um, so that's why wildlife corridors are so important, wildlife fencing is so important, so that these animals can stay relatively where their populations are. We also really need to look at the fact that we have had full populations wiped out with these fires and that with the right controls, with the right treatment, with the right um, examination of these animals, we could potentially be restocking areas that just have nothing and have very little chance of repopulating. Excellent, sorry, I'm just finished. I'm just typing out to someone who um, obviously was <clears throat> talking about some of the um, bike tracks planned in national parks and the, with that legislation. So I was just commenting that uh, <clears throat> if anyone's got any questions or, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> thoughts on the new legislation, I would definitely recommend contacting your state, the state government or your local state MP to raise any issues that you have. And uh, yeah, I think with anything like this, the more voices they hear, the more likely they're going to be taking this thing, these into consideration. They're not going to hear your own uh, personal grumblings. So definitely you make sure your voices are heard. You've got good voices. <clears throat> anyway, I think um, we oh no, uh, I think we're kind of wrapping up a bit now. I think we've finished all the questions, but just wanted to say a massive thank you again, Emma. Really, really appreciate your time today and obviously all the work you do. Um, I really hope that everyone's really been able to take on board all the advice that you've given, fencing and netting and even just uh, how to check pouches, things like that. Um, yeah, it's just been fantastic. And I think, you know, knowledge is power and hopefully we all feel a little bit more powerful and able to look after our native wildlife. So really, really appreciate your time today. Thank um, you. I'll just quickly say we do have um, another webinar coming up uh, on the 26th of February. That's Saturday, the 26th of February at 10 a.m. to 11.30. That's going to be frogs of the Yarra Ranges. So it's going to be teaching you all about all the different types of frogs that you're likely to find out uh, in your wetlands or even just by your creeks and anything like that for your ponds. So really do check in, join, tune into that. Uh, it's always really interesting to learn different noises and what you're actually hearing when you're out walking around. Um, there's just a lot of messages of thanks coming to you, Emma, uh, just a really informative and a wealth of knowledge. So, yeah, and also uh, the last thing I'll say is that this webinar has been recorded, um, so it will be on the Air Rangers Council website and YouTube within about a week or so. 
Um, so if there's anyone you feel you'd want to send it on to, please do uh, get that information out to your family and friends. And uh, yeah, we'll be looking forward to seeing you all again for our next webinar. But uh, one more time, yeah, definitely go and check out Bungalow Creek Wildlife Shelter on Facebook. Get that uh, wildlife rescue number into your phones. And uh, yeah, make sure you spread the word because the more people know, the more, uh, more animals we can all look after. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emma. Have a fantastic Saturday, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye.